Chapter 50 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter 50 Mademoiselle de la Vallere. Born 1644, died 1710. Davenport Adams. It must be acknowledged that Louis the Fourteenth, in his amours more refined than his contemporary Charles the Second of England, sought for mental gifts no less than personal charms, and, if caught at first by the eye and the lip, the bloom of the cheek and the lustre of the hair, could only be held by the surer and more exquisite fascination of a clear judgment and a lively wit. He was not content with a dumb Venus. Beauty was required to wear the robe of Payot and to borrow some, at least, of the magical spells of the graces. Criminal as were his attachments, and fatal to the heart and soul of his people by the general levity of manners and morals, which they necessarily seemed to justify, they were clothed with a pomp and refinement that concealed their most hideous features. The most romantic of Louis's attachments was that which he professed for Mademoiselle de la Vallière, born in 1644 of a noble family which had been long established in Touraine. While yet a child, she lost her father, and was brought up at Blois, in the household of Gaston of Orléans. Her features, as we learn from Elizabeth of Bavaria, Duchess of Orléans, had an inexpressible attraction. Her figure was beautiful, her appearance modest. She limped a little, but this did not ill become her. Her forehead was smooth and white, and on each side of it clustered abundant curls of a glossy auburn. The soft, languishing eyes, the straight nose, the exquisite mouth, and the dimpled chin, with a certain eloquent air of love and gentleness, made up the most fascinating countenance. All the figure was firm and plump, not one of your angular forms that bristle with sharp points, but the shape of a Venus, rich in graceful curves and softly rounded. There was a peculiar charm in her conversation, it so sparkled with that light, effervescing humour, which in the mouth of a pretty woman is accounted wit, while it breathed an air of refinement that indicated a graceful and accomplished mind. A sweet temper, and a gentle disposition won the affection of all her companions. She was capable of a passionate love, a deep and unalterable love, devoted to its object, and utterly regardless of itself. She was not ambitious, except of being loved, and that is an ambition which a man willingly forgives to beauty. Envy and jealousy shrunk afar from her generous soul. Finally, La Vallière had all the softness, if she lacked purity, of Imogen, the self-abandonment of Juliet, the passionate fidelity of Ophelia, but nature had rendered it impossible for her to play the part of a Cleopatra. She was formed to yield, to obey, to suffer in silence, and the secret of her power lay in the simplicity of her devotion. The beautiful La Vallière is still the heroine of the people. Her story is a tale of passion, of guilt, of sorrow and penitence. It has had peculiar attractions to the popular mind, and, while it has contributed poem, romance, and history to French literature, it has not been neglected by the English writer. It certainly possesses the most striking features of romance. Consider the quality of the actors. A powerful sovereign in the flush of youthful pride, contrasted with a young and simple maid of honor. Consider the startling variety of the passions. Ardent and aspiring love. Triumphant possession. Satiety on one side and sorrow on the other. Remorse and a long repentance. Consider the picturesque character of the scenes the glittering pomp of a palace, the austere simplicity of a convent. And then there is thrown over the whole the bewildering atmosphere of splendor, nobles and pages, statesmen and beauties, priests and counselors, music and flowers, and the glow of a thousand lights, the fall of powerful ministers, the intrigues of subtle courtiers, all blend in the exciting movement of this passionate and fantastic drama. And yet it is an old, old story, the brief madness of love, the prolonged penitence of remorse. It is a fine commentary on exultant sin, this dreary old age of shattered hopes that closes all. End of chapter 50